Project Zion podcast. I'm Susan Oxley. I'll be your host today. I'm from Seattle, Washington in the United States. And this is the series Climate Brewing, all about various topics concerning climate weirding, climate change, uh, climate crises and emergency. Today, um, I'm here with my good friend, Rod Downing, who is the chairman of the North American Climate Justice Team. And I've enjoyed working with him on that team. And we um, we have involved ourselves in a lot of different issues. We've learned a lot along the way and uh, are really enjoying doing the webinars uh, that you are all welcome to attend. So welcome, Rod. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, anyway, glad, glad to be here. Uh, always enjoyable and always... Uh, uh, Looking forward to discussions on the climate uh, crisis. So thanks for making this possible. Oh, I'm glad that you're here, Rod. You know, I've been hearing a lot about greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide for decades, as have you, I'm sure, in the 40 years that you've been involved with environmental issues. Just recently, however, there's been a rising interest in articles and and in the media about methane, which is one of the greenhouse gases, but one we don't hear about that much, and now we are. I know from comments you've made to the climate justice team that you've done some research on methane and um, enjoy sharing information about it. So I'd like to focus this podcast on that greenhouse gas. So let's start out with what is methane and why is it important? Yes, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, the scientific community was no was no different. CO two was considered the and is still the primary um, uh, uh, problem when it comes to this greenhouse gas and how it forms and the effects it has. But what they later came to do is say, well, what other what other gases affect this? And they they came up with a few and methane came at the top of the list. Now uh, so here's how it went. They started with CO2. Then they recognized that, and CO2 as this heat trapping gas, that is the sun comes through the atmosphere and it comes through as UV rays. You know, that's why we have sunblock, uh, you know, UV spectrum um, sunblock. So it's it's a very common understanding that we all have because it hits our faces and it's going to give us sunburn. Um, uh, and so that comes through and then, but a lot of it bounces off the earth or even our foreheads and goes back out into space as infrared, uh, which, you know, is that heat that you feel from a fire or or you know from the earth from pavement when it gets really hot you know so that's the infrared going back out into space and when it does it hits those co2 atoms and some of that some of those uh co2 atoms will in fact bounce that heat back down and that's how it forms sort of this blanket so that's the very basics of of how uh, it became known, sort of as this blanket that heat that can heat up the earth, uh, even though it's coming from the sun and this, you know, and the sun on the way through, it just goes straight through the CO two atoms. But on the way back up, it's now infrared. Uh, so. Um, that's the basic mechanism and then they came to realize oh no it's not the only gas that works like this when when those rays go back up into the atmosphere if it hits methane it is 
in the first few years of the, those methane molecules being in the atmosphere, it is 80, over 80 times more potent than CO2. Um, what, do you and, mean by, what do you mean by more potent? I mean, the heat goes up, sure. it hits a molecule, it comes back down. What, what makes it more potent? Right. Uh, it, it's a more complex molecule and so has more ability to, to, uh, interact with that infrared, uh, light coming up and bounce it back to earth. So in those first few years, it has over 80 times more ability to bounce that infrared back to earth and thus make it 80 times more uh, potent than CO2 in terms of heating the earth. Uh, so if I understand you correctly, the heat that has been converted from light energy to heat down below goes up and some of it passes through the carbon dioxide, but not much of it passes through the methane. Right. Um, but the main thing is just to, to was the recognition that it is so much more impotent, sorry, so much more potent of a greenhouse gas. Now, the one difference between methane and CO2 is CO2 is I guess you you could call it a really sturdy gas. There's not much that's going to break it down for hundreds of years. So it's going to stay up there and keep becoming that blanket for hundreds of years. Whereas methane, it's only potent really at that level for about the first 10 or 12 or plus or minus years. And then, and and it breaks down basically to CO2 and and water. So after about 10 or 12 years, it's still going to be potent, but only as potent as CO2. And then it just, and then that aspect, you know, will like CO2, well, it be, is CO2, stays up there for, you know, hundreds of years. But it's 80 percent, you know, that overwhelmingly greater ability to heat the earth disappears <clears throat> after those first 10 years. Now, what's the significance of that is that in those first 10 or 12 years, we have this incredible opportunity to have an 80 times reduction if we can reduce the methane. And that's why it is such a key thing in my mind, because wow, if you can if you can find ways to reduce methane fairly easily, then you're reducing an 80 times reduction in that warming that is occurring as we speak. Gives us a good decade to find some of the longer term solutions for the actual CO2 uh, issues. And we need a lot of research to, you know, completely get us back to the levels that we, that are going to be safe levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that gives us lots of time. So that's to me why you know, it's a strategic importance. It it gives us that um it 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 simply gives us that ability uh to make a huge impact which allows us then uh, a bit of breathing space for the longer term issues that are gonna be much kind of uh more difficult uh to to get to. Most government agencies, scientific agencies, recognize that too, and we're pushing, are pushing around the world. That is, I live here in Canada, and 
we're making trying to make special policies for methane um, while at the same time of course putting a lot of research into co2 um, and at the recent inflation reduction act definitely had methane as one of the key components to target to try and reduce very quickly those um, um, that gas via policy. That's uh, that's hopeful. If policies end up being substantial, that is enforceable, and 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 that of course gets into the political realm, and that's where. We may need to become advocates if the political will is too weak. The world will need to wake up and advocate specifically for that because of its advantage. Okay, so recently, the reason I am aware of the methane is not because I'm a scientist, but because the media has picked up on that. Is that because scientists are publishing more about this? Is it the scientists that are driving the change in focus? Or is there something else that is creating enough interest in methane that the media is picking it up? The, the role of a true journalist is to get down to the truth of the issue and 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 such. But the media corporation... <laughs> Its purpose is to make money for the corporation, and so they'll pick they'll pick up on simply uh, eye catching stories. And fortunately, I suppose one way or the other, uh, one of the more interesting or amusing eye catching stories was probably that cows, um, uh you know, they eat the grass and they've got all those stomachs that it goes through. Well, the the fact is uh, coming out the front end, that is belching back out the front, their, their mouths uh, comes a fair bit of methane. And so I think, I can't say for sure, but my guess would be that that sort of became an interesting angle to say, hey, all our cows are belching out this meth. And matter of fact, at first they didn't even realize it came out the front end. They thought it was the back end, which I suppose makes it a little funnier or whatever. But um, uh, that could be part of that could be part of the reason. But for sure, the more serious journalists were looking at the science, and the scientists had by that time recognized they can't simply do science. They have got to get people and and climate scientists themselves have got to be uh, translating it into public um, um, language that would be easily digestible by journalists and then the media itself. So it's a combination of factors. But it, it, it is simply that it is such a significant um, ability to get, you know, to sort of fast track uh, some initial uh, response and lower these emissions. I think at the end of the day, you'd say would be the driving factor in it all. Uh, and all of these other things are, are just kind of interesting uh, aspects to that. So there's recently been some other articles about methane concerning um, the uh, thawing of the permafrost, uh, swamp gas, oh, uh, methane pipe leaks. Um, can you comment on some of those those uh, newsworthy items? Sure. I, I mean, <laughs> on the one hand, that's where some of the really troubling aspects come in, but it's also some aware of some of the exciting. Uh, let, let me start with the troubling ones, in particular, the permafrost. So this has to do with the northern hemisphere. I mean, Canada, so uh, yeah, I definitely know, know uh, quite a lot or 
and sorry, am aware of quite a lot simply because our news media covers it, because uh, a good chunk of Canada it, it is in the northern area, which doesn't have much of our pop, our, you know, most of our populations within a hundred miles of the U.S. border processing and things like that that are up there. Mm-hmm. In 2012. I had an opportunity to go to Churchill, Canada, uh, which yes. is up near the Arctic Circle. And when I arrived there, I was with a <coughs> sorry, I was with a, a group to um, uh, at a science station exploring what was happening to the polar bears because of climate change. I learned that they have had 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 a recent crisis in Churchill because the thawing of the permafrost in the few years prior to that had so disrupted the rail lines for the only train going as far north as Churchill that brought all of their supplies, their food, their medicines, everything that had been totally disrupted by the thawing of the permafrost and the, uh, the shifting of those rails. And that it was going to take a couple of years to get that fixed and for the train to be back in operation, if ever, as the permafrost continued to melt. And so they had immediately begun growing hydroponic vegetables and arranging for supplies to be brought in by airplane. But it was uh, an eye opener to me for how the, how the thawing of the permafrost affects normal everyday life for those that are in the northern part of Canada. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's become even, a, you know, that's over 10 years ago now. And uh, that awareness was um, always with the uh, Inuit and First Nations people up there because they live it and they depend on it. Whereas, as I say, for the rest of us who are down within 100 miles of the U.S. border, you know, we had no awareness of of how quickly uh, things were changing. Um, uh, so let me make two quick comments. One is the very first person that we had on our series of webinars. He was from the IPCC and one of the co original co authors. One of the things he mentioned is that the north, the farther north, the faster the warming is occurring. And the Inuit were definitely seeing that long before everybody else. And they were like, so first of all, let, let's define permafrost or at least get, make sure we're, we, we have a handle on that. So when you're up north, there, you know, they still have a summer where, you know, the flowers come out. <clears throat> you get up above the tree line, there aren't any trees anymore, but still you get flowers and grass and things like that, just like you would here. But if you dig down deep enough, you only have to go down a few feet, you're going to still hit ice. In other words, that layer of soil is sort of like a blanket that keeps the, that soil that is underneath in a permanently frozen state, thus the word permafrost, it's permanently frozen. And they depend, they had depended on that for thousands of years. Um, and roads, roads were affected the same way. You know, suddenly, suddenly these roads where that they depend on during the winter because it's solid and stable and you can get truck after truck after truck on it or rail line. Uh, so, yeah, up north, they are noticing changes much faster than here. And one of them is, as you say, permafrost. And the other aspect, and here's where the tie-in comes back to methane, is that that permafrost when it melts it has um locked 
in a lot of the methane because methane is most of it comes from um, uh, plant matter that has decayed in various forms. Thus, you know, your city dump site's going to have methane because there's going to be organic matter that decays. Well, that's going to decay into methane, amongst other things. And just any normal uh, area that has water that's going to help decay the matter is going to turn into methane. So there are these huge, so just think of the entire northern part of the planet all across Russia, all across uh, Canada, and some of the Nordic countries. They all have the same issue that this methane is gradually um, uh, melting, and as it melts, it releases that methane. And remember, that's 80 times more potent. So that's another reason it became such a big issue. That's like a tipping point. So simply releasing that ginormous amounts of methane, 80 times more potent than CO2, boom, that's like, it, it's still going to take place over a number of years, but nonetheless, that's a real tipping point that we don't want to reach because it's going to take us into weather that we don't ever want to see. So that's why methane is so important. So that's the downside. What's the good news? The good news is, first of all, we've woken up to it. But the best news is because met because you can't see methane, well, where are the sources? Yeah, we know, okay, when the permafrost melts, we got it. We know cows, whenever they eat grass, are going to release some of it. Um, but really, the primary source is in the oil and gas industry because uh, simply extracting oil What's oil other than, you know, millions of year old organic matter that has, you know, uh, changed into uh, these other forms of carbon. But along with that is going to be pockets of methane. And so all the oil uh, extraction that goes on, uh, along with that's going to come methane. Now, some of that they can they can pipe it, you know, capture it and pipe it and use it as natural gas. But a lot of it they just flare off, and that's when you see these these um, stacks, you know, these stacks uh, in the middle of this great oil producing this oil drilling area that, you know, just have these flares going off. Well, that's what they're doing. They're just flaring off the methane because that's the cheapest, that was the cheapest thing to do with it. Um, Is it possible to capture it and make use of it? Well, yes, um, that's part of the solution. Now, uh, but the first part of the solution is that because it was odorless, sightless well nobody really recognized i mean they did know that there were leaks in these pipes um but they didn't realize how bad it was uh until they actually started using airplanes that could detect these leaks and it's too bad this isn't a vi podcasts aren't visual where I could show you, and there are these just, you know, the airplane will go along and there'll be a little leak here. And so you'll, the, the, you'll see this small plume, but then you'll see this massive plume that's been going, that Lord knows how long it's been, you know, spewing out methane and nobody knew. And some of these things, all it requires to fix is somebody with a wrench to tighten down some loose um, you know, some loose bolt or something. Now, some of it's more complex, but some of it is largely that simple. Um, and in all cases, it's sort of a win-win as long as methane, which 
which as a as a useful gas is simply called natural gas um, uh, and is you know is a major source for heating homes um, that the industry should have some incentive not to be way i mean that's all wasted you know from a oil and gas perspective that's a wasted resource that's just dissipating so there should be some incentive on the industry side to fix all these leaks so they don't lose all that value the yeah the profits until that we can get to the point where we don't need anything because we can get everything off of renewables i mean we've got a long way to go but that's part of the transition and for sure to stop those leaks now we've gone beyond that. The even better news is we've gone beyond that. Canada has had a, oh, at least I don't, I'm not sure how many, but a few satellites. We now have satellites that can detect, you know, because of course, if you watch the movies, you've got these spy satellites that can read a newspaper, you know, read the heading of a newspaper and stuff like that. Well, um, these satellites couldn't can't quite detect each cow's amount of methane you know it, it's not down to that level but it's def definitely at the level of any of these leaks in the pipes anywhere that it you know as it circles round and round and round the earth uh it can pick them up and now the u.s just this past year has put up the next generation level that can detect methane at incredible accuracy and one of some of the reports that came out of that is oh, oh we thought methane was leaking at you know x rate but we're, we're now discovering that it's almost double you know we've miscalculated uh, yeah almost double you know significantly it is significantly more of an issue than we wow. thought and so that's part of the reason when you know here we've been trying to reduce our co you know our our greenhouse effect and gee it seems to be the hardest thing to get that that curve that's going up to flatten and go down well, here's one of the reasons why is because we didn't have the accurate ability to detect methane. Now we do. There is no excuse. Um, and personally, if I could make a policy, I would put huge penalties on any industry where they where these satellites can detect uh, the methane. And if it isn't fixed within X months, there is some huge, you know, that's a type of, that's the type of policy uh, that needs to be in place. My gosh, we could drop that level so much faster if we took methane seriously. So one of the areas that an individual could get involved and make a difference is if we, say, wrote letters or emails to our legislators. Uh, advocating for uh, stricter policies on methane gas leaks. Absolutely. Um, and like I say, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there were some policies, uh, but I simply, because I'm not in the States, I simply haven't followed that in detail to know. I know it is having some effect, but I don't know the ins and outs of all the politics and such, and and so don't want to start getting into uh, into that aspect. But f right. for sure, it is not a it is not a partisan issue. Like I say, it is an issue that even for the industry, they could be saving money or making more money if they address this. Uh, so advocacy is is for sure uh, one of them. These aren't the only areas. I mean, they're the two was two two of the biggest areas: the 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 permafrost and, and well, the biggest one is simply the oil and gas industry leaks. That's that's by far the biggest. 
Um, and then the permafrost is simply, it's starting to show up, but nothing like where it, it it's headed for. Like we're talking a mass of possible, uh, you know, almost catastrophic changes if we don't uh, get a better handle on that, because that's that's going to be millions of square miles uh, around the world that are gradually just going to start, you know. <laughs> emitting methane and i don't know how in the world you'd, you'd you'd get a handle on that or turn it into anything useful um that's a that that that's when you just want to stop in its tracks um but there are there are other like as i say city dumps you know they should be capturing all the methane that comes from there in in every place uh where where there is any type of rotting um, plant vegetation, you know, due to water or whatever, um, uh, it is, is an area where, you know, so, you know, rotting seaweed, you know, things like this are all possibilities. Oh, actually, cute little story um, has to do with seaweed. They found that if, and it doesn't take much seaweed. Give a little bit of seaweed, and it has to be the right type of it. It's some type of red seaweed. Uh, it, but put that into the feed of cattle, and you reduce their methane uh, output by, uh, I don't know, up to 50 to 80 um, percent. I, I think wow. it's a little, a little uncertain. Um, so, you know. They're coming up with very innovative means, and it's just, you know, cattle industry is a huge industry to get it, to get full buy-in takes time. Hopefully, I've gotten across the significance of the issue, like for the here and now, it's, it's, it's the thing that can, that can quickly drop, um, it, it can't, it's not enough to get us down to the uh, levels of the Paris Agreement, but it actually gets us fairly close. And the key thing is that should there be uh, strict enough policies to actually, you know, force this into uh, into reality, we need that time to find those. Uh, trickier solutions, and methane is is one of the chief ways of of giving us that time. So mm -hmm. that's the prime takeaway in 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 my mind is it is such a potent thing. Um, the only thing that really that's more potent and and here is something that you could uh, a separate takeaway is if you have an air conditioner that that'll be using the HCFCs. Um, uh, if they leak, <laughs> they leak at an incredible uh, potency of a th of a thousand times that of CO Oof. two. So completely wow. separate from methane at eighty five percent, for sure. If you've got a heat pump or an air conditioner, make sure it stays maintained because if it starts leaking stuff, it's doing it at a thousand fold. Um, uh, uh, compared to CO2 in terms of being a green, potent greenhouse gas. So a, a bit of a sidebar, but hey, it's all part of the, the same goal. Um, and, and But methane being so, uh, so universal in the oil and gas industry, in all the waste that we have, and simply in nature's cycle of, you know, growth and decay, you know, uh, there's so much opportunity there for us. So th that to me is why I focus on it. It's a very hopeful thing. Uh, we just have to get over the hurdles that are our human propensities and get it done. 
Well, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your sharing the information that you've had and the research you've done and the clarity that you've given for how we can best address the low-hanging fruit of methane as we uh, try to find some solutions for the greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much, Rod. Glad to, and thanks for the opportunity.